Conservation District. And today we are filming the introduction of our Restoring the Nature of Illinois school field study. This is so that you can watch it in your classroom today and then hopefully you will join us afterwards on a virtual hike. Let me go ahead and explain what we've got laid out on the floor here. This is what we call our three-dimensional map or our living map. And it's meant currently to represent what is today Glacial Park, but that same land about 300 years ago. So what it has, keep in mind, is 300 years ago, this is what was here. So we have a kettle marsh. A kettle is formed by a large glacial ice chunk breaking off and melting and making a kettle hole and then water filling in. This marsh happens to be very diverse, lots of variety. Cattails are one of the first uh, plants to grow in the marsh. We also have ducks. We have a muskrat. We have turtles and frogs. We have giant mosquitoes. Well, they're not actually giant even back then. We have the wading birds like the great blue heron the sandhill crane, and the whooping crane. We have the songbirds, like the red-winged blackbird that nest in the cattails. We have dragonflies, and we have a small fish. So that is a very healthy wetland ecosystem. If I go over here to the brown uh, oval, that's another kettle but instead, this particular kettle hole got plugged up, kind of like a plugged up sink. And so not as much oxygen is in there, things don't decay very well, and it's become a somewhat acidic ball. Not nearly as diverse, not the same variety. The most common plants are the leatherleaf plants that grow on top of the sphagnum moss that lays all across the bog. As far as animals, there's not a lot specific to the bog. I put the deer here because they like to eat the leather leaf. We've got a butterfly here and a cardinal. And then the rest of them around here are part of this woodland ecosystem. So we have trees no, to delineate the woodlands here. And these are going to be animals that live that need trees. So you have the raccoon, the cardinal, woodpeckers. You have the wild turkey. The coyote could pretty much go wherever he wanted. We have him sitting in the back of the woods here. We have the skunk in the woods, of course, the squirrel, an owl, and again, it could roam wherever it wants, the wolf. What we then have is the largest part of Illinois at that time, the tall grass prairie, made up of tall grasses and flowers, such as the yellow coneflower, the blazing star, we have big blue stem grasses and Indian grass, there's more on the other side, the big blue stem grass, the switchgrass, the Indian grass, and the prairie is going to be inhabited by different animals, those that do not need the water as much, nor the woods, the trees. So you have lots of insects, like the ladybug over there, like the beetle here, like the grasshopper here, Praying mantis here. We have the insect eaters, like the bluebird. And we have other prairie creatures that roam the prairie, like the bison. And then all the way back at the other end, this animal, not to scale, the elk. We also have lots of snakes in the prairie. And that includes 
Chicken Chicken and lives in the prairie, so it's called the Prairie Chicken. Finally, on the west side of the park, the west side of our map, north is facing that way, we have the Nipperson Creek. And in the creek, we have a bald eagle, lots of fish, a beaver, a river otter, and a mussel. So I could have put signs of Native Americans in this map. They certainly lived here for hundreds, even thousands of years. But the reason I don't have anything here is our local Native Americans were nomadic. That means they moved around a lot and they did not build permanent structures. So the people that really made the changes to the way this map looks were the earliest of the European settlers, the pioneers. And when they moved out here, they did want permanent structures. In fact, the very first thing they would want upon moving out here is their dream house. And so they would have to cut down some of the trees to build their house. Then they need to eat. Certainly they learn some things from the Native Americans about how to eat the native plants. They learned that you could eat and hunt and eat elk and have elk stew and turkey sandwiches and bison uh, burgers and prairie chicken shish kebab. They could fish in the river, but that wasn't quite enough. The other thing that they learned from the Native Americans is that if you wanted to survive on this landscape, you needed to plant your own garden. And so first they were just family gardens, but then as more and more people moved out here, they specialized into specialized crops. So say for example, somebody decided to become an oat farmer. Well, what they found out was that the prairie soil was excellent for planting. And so they cleared some of the prairie to plant their oats and other crops. This was a in a time when before cars, so a major form of transportation and help on the farm were horses, but horses didn't happen to eat blazing star and yellow coneflower, so you had to clear space in the prairie for them and plant timothy hay and clover and the things that they would eat. Other animals were brought over as well. Cows, pigs, chickens, sheep, and again, they don't eat the prairie species. So you've got to clear out some of that, more of that prairie. If you want to protect those animals, you're going to want to build a barn. So you're going to chop down some more of these trees. Suddenly you can see that we're starting to lose some of these early ecosystems. And as the woods began disappearing and the prairie began disappearing, people looked over at the wetlands and said, what a waste. They're full of mosquitoes. They stink like those plants that grow in them all day long. We can't build in them. We can't plant in them. Let's get rid of them. So sure enough, some of our ancestors from Belgium and the Netherlands knew how to drain wetlands. And they introduced the drainage tile, which what you do is you dig ditches and you lay the drainage tiles end to end to end. And what that does is it drains away the water and all of the species that live there, but it makes it a great dry place to build or to plant crops. What did happen was all that excess water from all the drained wetlands were headed towards the Nipperson Creek. And suddenly, the slow moving Nipperson Creek was not fast enough to get rid of all the water. So now we're up to about 1950 when local residents did an amazing engineering feat, they dug a straight channel and straightened the Nipperson Creek. This did exactly what it was supposed to do, but the problem was the animals and plants that lived in the creek 
were used to the slow winding creek. Now it was a fast rushing creek. And animals that breathe through their gills couldn't survive that the siltiness of the fast rushing water, nor could mussels who eat by filtering the water through their bodies. And if you get rid of fish and mussels, well then you're gonna lose the animals like the river otter and the bald eagle that depend upon those for survival. There's a few other things that happened as well that I wanna change on this map. One of the things that you'll notice is I still have the big bison and the elk in the picture. Well, you can imagine with just little pockets of prairie left, these big roaming animals could not survive here anymore. So they were hunted and pushed out to where they had to go further west to find places to live. So I will remove those. We also brought plants from our homelands. A lot of you will probably know where your ancestors are from, England or France or Poland or Italy or Germany. Um, and a lot of people wanted something to remind them of home or sometimes they just brought seeds of plants on accident when they shipped over their favorite furniture. Well, these seeds that aren't from here are called non-natives and they become invasive or they take over because they don't have any natural enemies and they usually start growing earlier in the season. So this one, for example, is Japanese honeysuckle. And unfortunately, it takes over the woodland area and blocks baby oak trees from growing. Russian thistle gets into the prairie and blocks things like rattlesnake master from growing. We also brought non-native animals, such as the ring-necked pheasant, a beautiful bird from China that is fun to hunt and delicious to eat. But the problem is it got loose. They didn't keep them on hunt clubs and it went wherever it wanted. And the ring-necked pheasant turns out to be a bit of a bully. And he bullied the prairie chicken away from all of their prime nesting spots. Finally, Asian carp. Carp were brought over actually as a food, but they didn't catch on and they weren't very popular. So they started taking over and carp don't mind fast rushing water. So they thrived in the straightened Nipperson Creek. There's a few more changes I need to make to this picture to get it accurately up to 1971 when voters in McHenry County voted to make the McHenry County Conservation District. One of those is to remove, unfortunately, some of the other animals. The wolves, for example, were uh, feared by most people. If you remember the stories, even your ancestors knew them. The big bad wolf blows houses down and eats grandmother and little kids. So they shot the wolves upon seeing them. And in fact, there was a bounty on the wolves' heads, which meant that the government would pay you for every wolf you killed. The Mossasaga rattlesnake was also killed upon sight. Because if you want to protect your children, your family, your farm animals, you don't want venomous snakes roaming around in your fields. Other animals that started to disappear. The bluebirds couldn't find the right habitat anymore. Many owl species disappeared. Squirrels were fine, they learned how to adapt to humans. But deer, in 1901, were considered completely gone from the state of Illinois. Wild turkeys disappeared. Some of our woodpecker species disappeared. Raccoons adapted well to humans, and some of our insects and snakes stuck around. 
around as well. But this is a far different picture than what it was 300 years ago. So one of the things I want to mention before we start changing this map again is that I am not saying that our ancestors were bad because they straightened the creek. They didn't know what it may have had and may have done to the wildlife and the plants around it. I'm not saying that farms are bad. In fact, we still all need farms. Even if you get your food from the grocery store today, no matter what you had for breakfast, your waffles, your pancakes, your cereal, all were grains from the farm, your eggs and sausage and bacon all had came from animals on the farm, so did milk. So we have to have farms to survive. But this particular land that became in 1975 Glacial Park because the farmers that lived here sold it to the McHenry County Conservation District, we are not going to currently farm. So in that case, I'm going to take away things like the oats and the horses and the cows because they are no longer here. What I'm then going to do is I'm going to look to try to restore some of the nature back to this area. And one of the easy things to do is to take away the invasive species. These are not helpful to native animals. They're invasive, in fact, they're harmful. So if we take them away and plant native prairie species, we'll be increasing the possibility for more plants to grow and more animals to come back. If we take away the honeysuckle, we plant more oak trees. I'm gonna leave the barn and the house because we only tear down buildings if they're totally torn apart. We actually use many of the buildings that are on our site and we renovate them. So for example, the Lost Valley Visitor Center was once a farmhouse. Um, other things that I'm going to do here is I think I should plant a few more prairie plants and trees.
now there are wild turkeys all over the place. All right, over at the Nipperson Creek. We decided in 1999 that we no longer needed to keep the Nipperson Creek a straight creek for the neighbors. No one was putting drainage tiles into it anymore. It was time to re-meander it and make it a slow, winding creek once again. So we did that right on the path where it had been before. And amazingly, within two to three years, the fish and the mussels came back. Too. We see bald eagles almost every day in Glacial Park now. River otters have been spotted in McHenry County. We're not sure if they are permanent residents in the Nipperson Creek yet, but it's only a matter of time. Now there are a few animals that I cannot return to the picture. I mentioned already the prairie chicken. The other one are the rattlesnakes and the wolves. Unfortunately, I think people are too, still too afraid of them that we can't actually reintroduce them ourselves. Although wolves are moving further and further south, they're now as far south as Madison, Wisconsin, so they are spreading. But on the other hand, coyotes have kind of taken over their entire territory here. So I'm not gonna put any of those back. I can put the bluebird back. I missed him. They're doing quite well. And I can't put back the elk and the bison. Even though these are prairie species, we still do not have enough prairie at Glacial Park for, for animals this big. But there is some good news, especially for the bison, there are a couple of parks that are big enough in Illinois that they have bison. And three years ago, the first baby bison in 200 years were born in the state of Illinois. So they are around now, but not here. So this is more what you'd be likely to see on a hike to Glacial Park. We're gonna take you on a virtual hike. We can't promise what you're gonna see out there with us, but hopefully, when all of this is over, you guys will come out and hike and see how many of these plants and animals you can find. So behind me is the marsh that we talked about inside. It was the light blue colored fabric that had the huge variety of animal life inside of it. Now we're going to walk down this hill and up closer to the wetland. So you can see the groupings of cattails out there at the edge of the wetland. And if you listen carefully, can you hear the frogs? Those are called chorus frogs. Now we're gonna follow this trail up into the woods and we're gonna show you where we've been cutting some invasive species down. So this is actually a wall of buckthorn and honeysuckle. And you can see how this would block any native plants from being able to grow here. This is where we've been cutting with our school groups and they've cleared a huge area so you can see all the space between the trees where native plants can grow. Now we're gonna walk down towards the bog and show you that more closely. This is the kettle bog. Remember that was the brown oval on our indoor three-dimensional map? And if you also recall, I mentioned that it was like a plugged up sink and the water was acidic and not as much lived in it as in the marsh. So what you'll see is exclusively one kind of plant growing on top here. It's called leather leaf. And then there's moss underneath that that's actually floating on top of the water. 
What that means is that it's actually quite dangerous because it looks like solid ground, but if you tried to go out there and walk across it, you could actually fall in. And then the bog might be six or eight feet deep, as well as a bunch of decaying and rotting vegeta vegetation underneath. So early settlers didn't want their kids to go play in the bog. It wouldn't have made sense to just say, don't go play in the bog. So they told them the story of the bog man, which is supposedly a criminal who had done something awful in the village and he was hiding out in the bog. He was there for so long that he ended up being just like the bog, covered in sphagnum moss and stinking like the bog. And it was said that he would eat all his food raw because he didn't want to start any fires and give away his location. And maybe the bog man would even pull kids into the bog. So this frightened the children and they did not go play in the bog. They then told their children who told their children who told their children and just like a game of telephone, the bog man became the boggy man became the boogeyman. So now I'm standing in front of the prairie, which if you remember are tall grasses and tall flowers. You're not seeing any flowers and there's not a lot of living grass right now. This is all last year's older dead stuff. The peak of the prairie season is really once we get to midsummer, and then you'll see lots of color and greenery in the prairie. Behind me are hills called glacial caves. These were represented in our three-dimensional map inside as that bright green hilltop. The way they were formed was by the glaciers 12,000 years ago. A crack formed in the ice and a pile of gravel fell through that crack. What that means is the 75 feet behind me of gravel is just a small pile of gravel that fell through the ice. The ice chunks from the glacier would have been five times higher than that. Now we're gonna go back down. Behind me is the Nippersink Creek. This is the one that was channelized back in the 1950s and then in 1999 through 2001, we ended up putting the curves or the meanders back into the creek. This is a great creek for fishing, bird watching, kayaking and canoeing and has a lot of different wildlife and plant life. This is the Thomas Family Cemetery. The Thomas family lived here in the 1860s, so they were the second generation of families to come into the area. You might have all imagined that it was a difficult time to live out here back then. There were no ambulances, no phones, no hospitals, no indoor plumbing or heating or cooling, and lots of diseases. Five of the Thomas family children died before they reached adulthood and we believe that they were buried here under a large scarlet oak tree. The oak unfortunately got hit by lightning and had to be cut down, but you can tell just by looking at it that it was well over 250 years old and so was probably a big oak even when the Thomas family was here. Once we discovered the location, it's actually the conservation district that put the gravestones here. That's why they look brand new. And the reason they all say Thomas on them is because we don't actually know the names of the young children that died. Well, thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the introduction and the virtual hike. If you have any questions about any of this, feel free to email us at education at mccdistrict.org. And know that Glacial Park is open to the public even during the COVID-19 crisis 
And so as long as you stay in just your family group and maintain social distancing from other groups, you are welcome to come and hike on your own. So hopefully you'll come out here as well.